Welcome. I'm Rick Carney, coordinator for the Great Basin Landscape Conservation Cooperative. For those of you who may be new to the LCC, we are a partnership among public and private groups that are working together to meet large-scale conservation challenges across the five-state Great Basin region. We have supported a variety of conservation projects on high-priority science topics. This series highlights a few of those projects. We hope that these webinars can provide a platform for discussion about the research we support and its application to the Great Basin. We will keep today's presentations relatively short, about 30 minutes and reserve the second half of the hour for questions and discussions with the researcher. Since there are a lot of folks taking part in today's webinar, we're going to ask that you type in your questions as they arise during the presentation. We will read out your questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded and available for viewing later on our website. On your screen, you'll notice a small collapse control panel in the upper right-hand corner. By clicking on the small orange arrow button, you can expand this control panel. In the expanded control panel, you can send in your questions. Simply type your question into the chat box near the bottom and hit the send button. The question will be sent to us to respond to at the end of the webinar. I would like now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Peter Adler of the Utah State University. Peter is a plant ecologist who is interested in explaining population and community dynamics in space and time. He, along with his lab team, study coexistence and patterns of diversity, climate change impacts on plant populations and communities, and plant-animal interactions. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Peter Adler. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for taking the time to be here today. Thank you to Rick and the Great Basin LCC for the opportunity to present this work. I'm excited to tell you about this work. It's recently completed research, and it's a rare, not bad news story about climate change. I'm not willing to go so far as to call it a good news story, but it's pretty clear that it's not all bad news. Now on this slide I've listed myself as the presenter and not the author because this work is the result of a, a pretty large team. The researchers who did the heavy list, lifting are our postdocs and graduate students. So Katie Renwick is a postdoc who worked with Ben Poulter at Montana State University. She's on the call today to help me answer questions. Andy Kleinhesslink is a PhD student with me at USU. Caroline Curtis is a PhD student with Bethany Bradley at UMass Amherst. And Daniel Schlepfer is a former University of Wyoming postdoc who's also instrumental in this work. The other group of people I want to thank are Emily Kachurgis of the BLM, Mary Manning of the Forest Service, Tom Remington of WAFWA, and Eric Thacker of USU Extension. And they helped us think about the management implications of our research results. So the reason we're all here today is that Sagebrush Steppe has become a focal point for a pretty major conservation effort. And of course the poster bird for this effort is the greater sage grouse. It's motivating a lot of the current work, but we shouldn't forget that Sagebrush Steppe provides habitat for more than 350 other species of conservation concern. Many of these are obligates. Many of them depend on sagebrush for winter forage when other food sources are scarce. This emphasis on sagebrush conservation and restoration represents a pretty remarkable paradigm shift. It wasn't too long ago that sagebrush research and man management was focused on eradication, not on restoration. If, if we told a manager or a researcher working in the 1960s or 70s, maybe even the 80s, if we could go back in time and tell them that we were now spending millions of dollars on seeding and, and transplanting sagebrush, I imagine they'd be pretty surprised. Uh, so, the, so the lesson here is that we should be thinking a few decades ahead as well. And it's hard to think about the future without confronting climate change. This is a figure from the IPCC. It's showing global surface warming, average surface temperatures over time. So 
So starting in 1900, coming up to the present, this black line is the observed change in surface temperature. And then these red lines are projections from a suite of global circulation models showing different emission scenarios. So under a, a business as usual, fairly high greenhouse gas emission scenario, that's the red line. These models project on average about a four degree Celsius increase in temperature by the end of this century. If we reduce our emissions, we might be able to decrease that expected warming a certain amount. Now, of course, this is the global surface average. In any particular region, you might expect more or less warming than this. And in fact, for the Intermountain West, models show slightly more than this four degree warming. You might expect a four, sorry, a five or a six degree Celsius warming by the end of the century. So before we make these million dollar investments in conservation and restoration, we need to think about how the species and habitats that we're working with might respond to this sudden environmental change. And it's not just researchers like me who are saying that we need to think about climate change. Federal land management agencies have issued directives that require their employees to conduct various kinds of climate change vulnerability assessments. So for example, here I'm showing the National Park Service's climate change response strategy. Over on the right, front page of the Forest Service's National Roadmap for Responding to Climate Change. These vulnerability assessments have at least two main objectives. The, the first is to identify threats. These assessments are meant to place climate change in the context of other conservation threats. So for example, in Sagebrush Step, we know that invasive annual plants and the frequent fires that they promote are a very serious threat. We also recognize land use change and energy development as important threats. Should we include climate change in this group of most important threats? If so, is it a threat everywhere throughout the region, or is it mostly a threat in certain places? A second goal of these vulnerability assessments is to help these agencies prioritize areas for conservation and restoration. So on the left of your screen, you'll see a map of greater sage-grouse priority conservation areas, clear, some clear conservation priorities shown here. But of course, we have other objectives when we're managing these public lands. Energy production is one of them. So the map on the right is from the Nature Conservancy. It shows oil and gas reserves. And you can see, say, if you look at Wyoming, see there's a high potential for conflict between sage-grouse conservation and energy production. In both those places, there's a lot of sage-grouse habitat. There's also a lot of oil and gas reserves. If you look instead at, what, at Nevada, say, you'll see perhaps less potential for conflict. There's sage-grouse ha habitat there. There's not as much oil and gas reserve. Okay, now imagine adding another layer related to climate change vulnerability. Will that Nevada habitat still be prime sage-grouse country in 50 or 100 years? What if the Wyoming habitat is likely to be less vulnerable to climate change? Would that change the kinds of decisions that planners make about where to exploit energy, where to invest in, in habitat conservation? So this is the kind of information that we're hoping to provide to planners. The existing literature provides some information about how big sagebrush responds to climate drivers, but it, it tends to raise as many questions as it answers. So by studying growth rings or leaf level photosynthesis, researchers have shown a wide variety of responses to precipitation and temperature. So for example, when conditions are very dry, sagebrush growth and photosynthesis rates tend to slow down, clear signs of water stress. On the other hand, in very wet locations or in very wet years, sagebrush can suffer mortality due to anoxic soil conditions or fungal diseases. Similarly, in sites or years that are too hot, we see evidence for water stress, but severe cold can also limit sagebrush performance, perhaps by reducing the length of the growing season. So there's potential for a wide variety of responses to changes in temperature precipitation. Furthermore, these studies have typically focused on just one process, say growth or photosynthesis. They don't tell us much about the population level response that we really want to understand. For example, if seeds and seedlings 
are limited by different factors than adult plants, then studies of adult growth or photosynthesis might not tell us much about how a population could recover following disturbance. So here's our research question. How will big sagebrush populations respond to future changes in temperature and precipitation? I want to emphasize that the scope of this research question, like any research question, is limited. We're focused on just one species, Artemisia tridentata. It is the foundation species for this ecosystem, but the quality of habitat for sage grouse and other consumers depends on many other plant species too, and we're not going to tell you anything about the responses of those other species. I should also mention here that we're lumping all subspecies of Artemisia tridentata together. We just don't have enough data to model each of these subspecies independently. A second limitation of our analysis is our focus on areas where sagebrush currently occurs, so the, the green areas shown on the map here. We really can't say much about the potential for sagebrush to expand into new areas. But I think the biggest limitation of our, of our work is our focus on what we call the direct effects of climate change. So the effect of precipitation and temperature on sagebrush holding interactions with other species, holding changes in abundance of other species, holding all that stuff constant. So we're ignoring the potential for climate change to influence annual grass invasions and fire regimes. And that's a point that I'll return to towards the end of the talk. Now remember that one of the goals of our project is to help managers make decisions about where to invest in sagebrush conservation and management. As you'll see, our answer to this first research question reveals some broad regional patterns that really does not provide fine resolution site-specific predictions about climate change vulnerability. And in fact, I suspect that researchers may never be able to provide reliable predictions at those fine scales. So how can managers incorporate our findings into their decision-making process? Well, we thought that perhaps our results could better inform management if we can relate them to some existing decision-making framework. An increasingly popular framework for guiding conservation decisions in the sagebrush steppe region focuses on resistance and resilience. And in particular, we're thinking about resistance and resilience to annual grass invasions and fire. Gene Chambers and colleagues have, have led a lot of this work. They've shown that dry, warm locations seem to be more easily invaded than cool, moist locations. Furthermore, they've shown that native plants seem to have a harder time recovering after disturbance, after fire, in those warm, dry places than the cool, moist places. Now, this resistance and resilience framework doesn't say anything about vulnerability to climate change, but the fact that resistance and resilience depends on soil moisture and temperature regimes, it's certainly suggestive. And so that leads to our second research question, the sagebrush vulnerability to climate change correlate with these resistance and resilience classes. In other words, are these warm, dry, low resilience places also more vulnerable to climate change? Now, unless we can travel into the future and see what happens, there's no way that we can answer our research questions with direct observations. We need models. One of the, the main jobs of researchers is to produce models. We have no shortage of models to choose from. Ideally, we use the model that gives the best predictions. But how do we identify that model with those best performing models? I mean, normally, we identify the best model by comparing observations to predictions. So in this cartoon here, showing the change in abundance of some species at some site over time, I'm showing predictions from three different models, three different colors, and one set of observations, hypothetical observations in black. And in this example, it's pretty clear which model, the orange one, is best matching observations. But in our case, we're trying to predict regional scale changes in abundance of sagebrush over the next century. We don't have those observations. We can argue from first principles about which model might work best, but we really have no direct evidence to lean on. Something that we can do, however, is to compare predictions from very different models and hope for consistency. So, so to illustrate this, consider this cartoon showing how two models predict the change in abundance of some species at different sites across a climate gradient. 
So at site number one, over here on the, the left, both the orange model and the blue model are predicting an increase in abundance in the future. So that consistency might give us some confidence. Similarly, at this third site, both models are predicting a decrease in abundance. Again, we might build some confidence in what the future holds at that location. In contrast, at site number two, the orange model predicts an increase, the blue model predicts a decrease. We have more uncertainty there. So this is the approach we take. We compare predictions of four very different models, each representing a different approach to the problem. So they're fit to different data, or they're built to represent different biological processes. Because the models are based on independent approaches and data sources, consistency in predictions that does emerge should be meaningful, should help us build our confidence. So I'm going to tell you now about the, the four models that we used. Our first model is based on spatial correlations. So this map on the right is more or less a map of sagebrush cover. So darker green areas, higher sagebrush cover, lighter green, lower sagebrush cover. And this map on the right is just a map of mean annual temperature. We can ask if areas of high cover tend to be characterized by higher or lower temperatures than areas with low cover. And we can repeat that correlation with many other climate variables. We might represent total annual precipitation or precipitation seasonality, etc. Now, you may recognize this approach as the basis of species distribution modeling. Typically, species distribution models are based on presence absence data. Those models just predict the probability of presence. Here, we're using abundance data, information on sagebrush cover. So our models will predict how a change in climate might cause a change in sagebrush cover. Now, the main advantage of this approach is that we are using real data. We're working at the regional scale that we're interested in. However, the disadvantage is that we have to assume that these spatial correlations, which reflect processes that have been operating over centuries to millennia, we have to assume that those correlations can also tell us something about how these populations will change over a shorter period of time, the span of a few decades. So there's a leap of faith required here. And as I'll show you, each of our models requires a different sort of leap of faith. Okay, our second model is based on temporal correlations. So imagine collecting data over time at one site. So one type of data we'll collect is about how, it, how populations fluctuate over time. In some years populations increase, and in other years they decrease. At the same place, we'll collect data on weather. So in this example, we've got annual temperature varying over time. We can then ask, how, what characterizes the years of population increases and the years of decreases? So in this hypothetical example over here on the right, in this example, years of population increase tend to be associated with warmer than normal temperatures, and years of population decrease tend to be associated with lower than normal temperatures. So my PhD student, Andy Kleinhesslink, he gathered existing data sets like these for hundreds of sites across the region. So these are plots or transects where researchers have estimated sagebrush cover year after year. He uses those data sets to estimate these kinds of patterns. And importantly, his model allows these patterns to vary across the region. So the kind of example I'm showing here with higher population growth in warm years, perhaps we expect to see this in a fairly cold site. But in a warm site, we might expect the opposite pattern. We might expect to see high population growth in cooler than average years and population decreases in warmer years. So his model allows those kinds of patterns to emerge. Now this approach has the advantage of focusing on the temporal dynamics that we're really interested in, changes over time. But it assumes that these short-term responses to interannual variation can help us predict population responses to long-term shifts in climate. So that's the leap of faith here. We're, we're really taking these short-term responses and, and extrapolating them out over a longer time period. Our third model is what we call a mechanistic model because it focuses on a particular set of biological processes, not just statistical correlations. So this model looks closely at sagebrush germination and seedling establishment. It uses daily temperature and precipitation data to estimate the probability that sagebrush seed germinates. 
It then models both water availability through the soil profile and root growth to determine if seedlings can survive the first growing season. Now we generally have more confidence in using mechanistic models like this to make predictions because they don't require as much extrapolation of purely statistical relationships. However, this model focuses on just a couple of life history processes that may not tell the whole story about population growth and persistence. So the leap of faith here is that the particular processes represented in this model are, if not the most important, are very important for the, the, overall, um, the overall population growth of sagebrush. Our fourth model is a dynamic global vegetation model. This is also a mechanistic model, but it's much more ambitious. So it starts by modeling leaf level photosynthesis. That determines the, the growth and survival of individual plants. Those individuals compete with each other for resources, and that resource limitation then feeds back to these leaf level processes. And all of those kinds of processes are influenced by external climate variables and by disturbance. And I should point out here that this is the only one of our four models that considers the influence of carbon dioxide concentration and takes into account expected future increases in carbon dioxide concentrations. Now again, we like basing predictions on these kinds of mechanistic relationships. However, this model has many, many parameters. A number of them are poorly estimated, so we have a lot of parameter uncertainty in this model, and that can undermine our confidence in the predictions. So the leap of faith here is that we, we have to hope that we've got good parameters built into this model. So we're comparing these four quite different models. I'll refer to the spatial correlations model as SC, the temporal correlations model as TC, the seedling survival model as SS, and the dynamic global vegetation model, DGVM. And remember, the key point that the real strength of our approach is that these four models are fit to different data sources. They represent different kinds of correlations. They focus on different biological processes. We use each of these models to generate predictions for 714 sites across the region. So these are the blue points in this map. The gray points are sites of known sagebrush occurrence which we have used to build the spatial correlations model. Most of these blue points correspond to the long-term data sets that Andy used to build the temporal correlations model. We, we added a few more points to this blue set. We took a few of those gray points, colored them blue, added them to our, our set to ensure that we were representing the entire climate space that's currently occupied by big sagebrush. So for each of these blue points, we make predictions with each of our four models. And actually, we make two predictions. One prediction is based on baseline climate data, basically historical climate data. A second prediction is based on future climate data projected by a global circulation model. And it's the difference between these predictions that we're interested in. If sagebrush cover or seedling survival is predicted to be higher in the future than at, in baseline than now, then that's a, a positive change, an increase in sagebrush performance. If the future prediction is lower than the baseline, then that's a decrease in sagebrush performance in the future. Those future projections come from two different emission scenarios. Today I'll just show you results from the, the higher emission scenario, the business as usual scenario, this RCP 8.5. We also have predictions corresponding to five different global circulation models. These represent a range of predictions for the Intermountain West from warmer and drier scenarios to, to cooler and not quite as uh, and, and wetter. Okay, so here's our first results slide. The four panels here correspond to our four different models, spatial correlations, temporal correlations, the DGVM, the seedling survival model. On the y-axis of each panel is change in either cover for three of our models or the percent of years with successful regeneration. That's for the seedling survival model. And on each of these y-axes you'll see is a dashed line at zero. That means the models are predicting no change. Points that fall above that line 
our places and GCM runs where our models are predicting an increase in cover or regeneration. Points that fall below those zero lines are places and GCM runs where our models predict a decrease in performance. And the first thing that, that oh, and I should also say that the x-axis here is, is mean annual temperature. So we're just displaying our results along this mean annual temperature axis to give you some idea of how these sites differ. So each point represents one site and one GCM run and uh, predictions from one model. So the first thing you'll notice is a lot of variability. There's a lot of spread along these y-axis. Our models predict increases in performance at some sites, decreases in performance at other sites. But there's some pattern to this variation, and that's shown by these, these simple linear fits here. You can see that in all four panels, there's a negative slope to these linear fits. So what our models are saying that at sites that tend to be quite cold, we're expecting to see increases in sagebrush cover or seedling survival in the future. At the hottest sites, in contrast, we're expecting to see decreases in sagebrush cover or seedling survival. <clears throat> the exception to that pattern is, is the DGVM, which seems to be more optimistic. So it's predicting increases in sagebrush cover pretty much all the way across this mean annual temperature gradient. And this is where that CO2 fertilization effect comes in. Remember, this is the only model that takes into account carbon dioxide concentrations. If we repeat these simulations, holding CO2 constant at its current level, then the predictions from this DGVM fall more in line with the other models. It still, it's a little bit more optimistic, but it, it, it falls more in line. So this consistent pattern that we see across the models with respect to temperature, it makes some biological sense. Perhaps at these cold sites, growing seasons are short, and warming may actually improve conditions, lengthen the growing season for sagebrush. Perhaps at these hot sites, climate change, pr primarily through warming, will make conditions worse for sagebrush by increasing water stress. I, I should remark here that what the GCMs show are, are fairly consistent and fairly large changes in temperature. The changes in precipitation are smaller and vary more among the GCMs. There's more uncertainty about how precipitation will change. So one thing that this figure doesn't show you is where these predicted increases and decreases are located geographically. So this is just a, a, a another way of looking at the same results. Here again, I'm showing our 714 sites. The color of each point shows both the direction of the predicted response and the degree of agreement among the models and those GCM runs. So blues are predicted increases in sagebrush cover or seedling survival. The reds are decreases, and the intensity of the color shows the degree of agreement among the models. So dark blue points are places where all of our models, the, the, I should say the darkest blue points, are places where all of our models for all the GCM runs agree on an increase in sagebrush performance. The darkest red points are where all of our models and GCM runs point to a decrease in performance. You can see that the blues cover a lot more area here than the reds. The reds are mostly located along the, this, this western and southern edge of the sagebrush distribution. There's maybe a pocket of pinks up here in the Columbia Basin, a little bit in the Snake River Plain, some of the, the salt desert areas in Utah as well. A lot of this area, the high desert of eastern Oregon, the basins of Wyoming and Colorado, Montana, we're seeing a lot of blue here. The other point to make is that while many of these points are dark blue, showing a lot of agreement among the models, we don't have that many dark red points. There are some pinkish points. There's really not that many dark red points. So when the models, the models tend to agree more on increases in sagebrush performance than on the decreases. We've identified two factors that seem to distinguish the red sites from the blue sites. Uh, by far the most important factor, and you saw in the previous slide, is simply temperature. Many of the sites where we see red are hot places. We're seeing these blues in the colder places. We also see a hint of a precipitation seasonality effect. 
So the sites along the western edge of the sagebrush distribution where we're seeing these reds and pinks, those tend to receive almost no summer precipitation at all. These bluer areas further to the east receive much more summer precipitation. But that seasonality effect really is, is weak compared to the temperature effect. Okay, so I want to turn now to our second research question about resistance and resilience classes. So here's a map from a recent publication showing resistance and resilience classes for the western portion of the sage-grass range. The red areas have low resistance and resilience. The greens have higher resistance and resilience. The idea is that we should try to locate our conservation investments in these green areas. So how do our climate change predictions relate to these resistance and resilience classes? We answered this by overlaying our 714 sites on a map like this and asking if the climate change responses that our models agree on vary systematically across these resistance and resilience classes. And here's what we find. Almost all of the sites where our models agree that climate change will hurt sagebrush are located in the low resistance and resilience class. And in fact, most of the sites where our models are uncertain are also in that low class. If we move into the moderate and high resistance and resilience classes, we find that almost all of our sites located in those areas, our models agree that at those locations, the direct effects of climate change might actually benefit sagebrush. Okay, so, so what are the management implications of these results? I think the most important message is simply one of hope. We're not finding strong evidence that climate change will be a grave threat to sagebrush across the range. Climate change, based on this analysis, does not mean that sagebrush conservation is a lost cause. Now notice that I'm not ready to believe that sagebrush will really benefit from climate change, as predicted by our models for many sites, and that's simply because of the limited scope of our analysis. But the absence of really bad news is great. Clearly, these systems are worth fighting for. Our models do predict some negative effects on sagebrush, but these appear limited to the hottest portions of the region. I think the implication is that we should question investing in these locations, especially where resilience and resistance is also low. Of those existing threats, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, across much of the region, climate change may have limited or even positive direct effects on sagebrush cover. So within those areas, managers should, should feel liberated to focus on the most important existing threats to sagebrush. And of those existing threats, I think the biggest and most uncertain comes from annual grass invasions and fire. And that's where we think future work needs to focus. So I'd like to make this point with a little cartoon here. Our work has focused on the direct effects of climate change on sagebrush. We've showed that in many places we expect some positive effects, in some areas we expect negative effects. In general, we're not sure how strong these effects might be. Now we know from lots and lots of previous work that this cycle between annual grass invasions and fire has very strong negative effects on sagebrush populations. And the key question going forward is how climate change will alter this cycle, this grass fire cycle. Will it exacerbate this problem in areas of the current range that we currently consider resilient? Will climate change limit fuel production and alleviate the problem in areas that have historically been hit the hardest? So we're really just starting to think about how to tackle this problem, but we think that's a priority going forward. So that's all I was planning to say. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, Katie and I would be happy to take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, we've received a few questions already from the audience, but just a reminder for those of you on the webinar, if you have questions that you would like to send to Peter, please type those into the chat box, um, and you can access that by clicking on the red arrow in the small control panel that you should see on your screen with the webinar software. And those questions will come to us and we will read them out for the presenters. So I've got um, three questions here are, that have already come in and I'll go ahead and start here with the first one. This is kind of a clarifying question. 
they came in when you were showing um, the different climate change scenarios that the models were using. And it's just asking, are you referring to atmospheric global circulation models or to ocean circulation models or a combination of both? The global circulation models, they're coupled atmospheric ocean models. So the, the GCMs that, that we're taking these future projections for, they include both oceans and the atmosphere. Great, thank you. And then a second question here, um, how do the models handle the potential? Maybe, oh, sorry, maybe go I ahead. Should, I should say something more about one of the sources of uncertainty here. You might remember that early in the talk I, I said I, I was skeptical that we'd ever be able to generate the kind of really fine scale predictions that managers might hope for. And one reason for that is that these GCMs are operating at a fairly coarse spatial resolution. Uh, with increases in computing power, they're getting finer, but I think that the, Katie might be able to help me here, I think that the grid cells in these GCMs are, they're like one degree latitude, longitude grid cells, so, you know, hundreds of kilometers. Um, we then, researchers like us who are trying to do more site-specific things, we have various ways of downscaling those projections but they involve some assumptions, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat crude process. So there's some, I guess there's really some inherent limitations about what ecologists can do given uncertainty in the climate models themselves. Great, thank you for that additional clarification. Um, another question that's come in from our audience here, how do the models handle potential more extreme temperatures? So higher highs and lower lows, not the average temperature, but the ends of the ranges. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and then I'll let, let Katie have a turn. Most of our, I think by models, the questions asking about our model, the models that we built, uh, not, not the climate models, but our sagebrush models. And in most, I'd say, in, uh, certainly for our temporal correlations and our spatial correlations model, we're not accounting for those extremes really at all. So we're looking at, at averages, responses to average conditions, and that's, that's certainly a, a, a concern about those models. Can they do a good job capturing extreme events? The, I think that the ceiling survival model and the DTVM, because they operate on a daily time scale, they, they will actually incorporate some of those extremes. Is that right, Katie? Yeah, that's correct. We took monthly temperature for those two models, but then used a statistical algorithm to extrapolate so that we would have daily temperature. And so those models were each run for a 30-year time period, and we looked at average cover during that period instead of using average temperature as an input. Great. Um, thanks to both of you. Here's another follow-up question related to the, um, oh, I'm sorry, I moved on my screen, related to the climate data. So um, for downscaled climate data, were you able to take advantage of the MACA models, or was that data not available in time for this study? Um, I can jump in and answer that. We were hoping to run these models at one kilometer resolution, which matched up with how two of the models were initially fit and to the scale of the soil data that we were using. So instead of using the MACA models, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, we did our own downscaling using DayMet data to bias correct the GCM data. All right, thank you. And lots of questions here now coming in from our audience, so I'll try and get through as many of these as we can. Um, uh, the next one for you is, since sagebrush is a long-lived species, have you considered time lag effects of sagebrush survival? Um, the seedling germination and survival models seem very important in recruitment of sagebrush. So the... Um 
for the, the, the two correlative models, the, the spatial correlations and that temporal correlations model, those, because those models are fit to existing data sets, that, that patterns of, of stage brush survival are going to be implicit in those models. It, it's sort of all in there. Uh, so in areas where, you know, for our spatial correlations model, areas that have high stage brush cover, well, perhaps they have high stage brush cover because stage brush survival is high in those areas. For the temporal correlations model, in years when sagebrush cover goes down, it could be because individuals are dying. Um, it could also be, I mean, sagebrush can shrink. You know, branches, individual branches will dry, will die, canopies will thin out. So for those more correlative models, the, the patterns of survival are, are built in. As you pointed out, the, as the the questioner pointed out for the seedling survival model, it's really just looking at survival of a particular life stage. And Katie, I'll let you address survival in the DGVM. Yeah, so survival in the DGVM, um, it's a lot more mechanistic and sagebrush can die because of things such as disturbance or drought stress and cover can also be reduced due to reduced recruitment as the climate changes. And so our hope was that by running the model for a 30-year period in the future and then looking at average cover over that period, we would be able to incorporate some of the effects of more rare climate events or um, areas of high mortality. Great. Thank you both. Um, another question here for you. So did this study identify approximate thresholds of temperature where sagebrush is more likely to increase or decrease? Well, I can, uh, let me go back some slides here. So one way that you could do that, I, I guess that was not our, I guess we could try to do that. I can try and explain why I'd be hesitant. Um, so if you look at at these figures here, uh, can they, Liz, can they, everybody still, still see my screen? Yes, you're still presenting. Okay. So where these, where these linear trends cross the x-axis, you could think of that as one of these climate pivot points, that at sites below in this example, you know, maybe we're looking at 12 degrees Celsius here, mean annual temperature 12 degrees. Sites that on average are colder than that now, we might expect increases in performance. Sites that are warmer, that, that are warmer than that now, climate change might have a negative effect. And, and for each of these models, you, you could look at where that, these lines are crossing that x-axis. Uh, and there's, there is some consistency among these. But, you know, there's so much uncertainty in these models that there'd be uncertainty just around these trend lines. I guess we uh, we didn't really feel that comfortable trying to estimate a, a specific um, number. And that's why we're emphasizing this general trend that in general, sites that are currently on the cooler side are more likely to not be hurt, to not respond negatively to climate change, whereas in the warmer sites, the sagebrush is um, more likely to be, be negatively affected by climate change. I, I realized that in answering this question, I was thinking about thresholds in, in terms of mean annual temperature across the region. The, whoever wrote the question might actually be thinking about thresholds in terms of the amount of warming in the future. Um, and I didn't, I don't know if they can quickly follow up, tell me if I went off down the wrong track there. All right, I'll keep an eye out for a follow-up um, to that question. And so if the original asker wants to further clarify, please feel free to type that in. Um, I, I guess I could sort of preemptively try and answer that, you know, in terms of how much most of our, our models don't necessarily have, I think that, well, okay, we actually did do some, the results that, that I showed you today are when we plug in temperature, we, we plug in GCM project projections, what climate may be like in the future. We did some other kinds of what you might think of as more of a sensitivity analysis, where we ask each of these models if the only thing that changes in the future is an increase in temperature, you know, 
holding precipitation constant at the baseline level, then how do things change? And we can play that game with a small change in temperature or a larger change in temperature. And just thinking about those results, the qualitative pattern is, is fairly similar for both small and large changes in temperature. We don't see evidence of some uh, a really obvious threshold there. W would you agree with that, Katie? Yeah, I'd agree. Great. And the um, question after just let us know that they were asking more about the amount of warming into the future. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I think that the qualitative, like I just said, the qualitative pattern shouldn't necessarily depend. It, it's not going to change with more or less warming. Great. Thank you. Um, we've received several questions here that are kind of looking or asking about um, invasive and noxious weeds and kind of how that is playing into um, the future of sagebrush with climate change. And so um, one question here is that I did not notice that the research accounted for invasive noxious weeds that tend to invade after catastrophic events that are predicted with climate change. Um, and related to that, we also had someone asking, um, you know, if this research was considering um, possible encroachment of other plants that might come with climate change. So if you guys could just kind of speak to that topic, I think that can help address a few of the questions here. Sure. Well, again, the, the answer is a little bit different for each of these models. So, so for example, when we think about that spatial correlations model, that is really built using re existing regional scale data, effects of, of invasive species and fire is, is built into that. You know, if, if we see lower sagebrush cover in certain parts of this geographic area, it might reflect that. Okay? Uh, similarly, with that temporal correlations model, if sagebrush does worse in certain kinds of years at certain sites, that could reflect the, um, the influence of, of these other kinds of species that sagebrush is interacting with. Um, for the, the seedling survival model, I don't think it considers other, it's a, it's, it's a truly single species model. It's, a, it's ignoring what is growing a, around sagebrush. And Katie, I'll let you talk about the DGVM. Yeah, the DGVM is a really flexible model. You can include as many different species as you'd like, limited only by the difficulty of parameterizing it for those different species. So for these results, we included a generic C3 grass, a generic C4 grass, and then juniper. So there was some potential for competition with conifers, although because our points were chosen to be areas that are currently almost entirely sagebrush cover, I didn't wind up with a lot of juniper in the output. The model, though, does not currently account for invasive annual grasses like cheatgrass, and that, I think, is a really ripe area for development. And, I, you know, we tried to be quite clear that our models, that, that we were not trying to deal with that grass fire cycle in, in this phase of the research. We think that's important to do next. I, I think, you know, one thing I'll just say from driving around the region is, is that I live, you know, here along the, the Wasatch Front, northern Utah. When I drive west from here out into the, the Great Basin, the impacts of annual grasses, invasive grasses, and fire is, is super obvious. But if I drive the other direction, if I go east into the, the Wyoming basins, cheatgrass is present. Uh, it apparently will increase locally after disturbances, but then the, the natives will come back in. You, you just don't see the same kind of dynamic. It's dry on both sides uh, of the Wasatch. You know, both of those areas are dry, but, but those Wyoming basins do tend to be higher and cooler than many of those great basin valleys. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I would really love to do some experiments to try and learn whether warming will change the, the, the behavior, the impact of cheatgrass in those cool, dry places to the east. Thank you. We've received several questions here about precipitation and kind of how the models are handling that. So I'm going to lump these together for you. Um, 
the first one is, did your precipitation modeling involve precipitation type? And then what about the survival of seeds without insulating properties of snowpack? And then kind of related to this is, um, can you discuss the probable impacts of any changes in the cold season precipitation? Katie, do you want to start on those, those first two? Um, yeah, so all of the models included precipitation in some form. The two correlative models included some sort of variable for total quantity of seasonal precipitation, I think, for different seasons. The mechanistic models do account for the insulating effects of snowpack. Both of them include some sort of measure of ground temperature that is dependent on how much snow there is, and that can affect germination and seedling survival in the seedling survival model, as well as growth and recruitment in the DGBM. And then what was the third part of that question? So the next part of that um, was kind of knowing that sagebrush are largely dependent upon winter and spring precipitation. Can you discuss the probable impacts of changes sure. uh, to cold season precipitation. Sure. So one of the reasons that, that we focus on, there's a few reasons we focus so much on temperature in our presentation. Um, first, the, the, the global circulation models are, there's a lot of agreement among them that things are going to get warmer. There's much less agreement among uh, about how precipitation patterns will change. So typically they won't project as much of a change in precipitation. There's less agreement among models. And so I don't, uh, I mean the only generalization that I might feel at all comfortable making is that at the higher latitudes, as you get to the northern edge of our region, you know, say if you're in Idaho, Washington, Montana, things look like they might get wetter. If you're t towards the southern part of our region, Southern Nevada, Southern Utah, there's an indication that things might get drier. That, that seems somewhat consistent across these different GCMs. But there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, so that's one reason you know, we see a stronger temperature signal, partly because there's bigger changes. The models include bigger changes in temperature than bigger changes in precipitation. We don't see, I, I, and Katie can correct me if there's something else that she's seen, but I haven't, I know people have talked about changes in precipitation seasonality. I haven't actually seen the, the climate models t showing that. Um, yeah, I haven't dug into that too much, but one thing that I would like to add is that the two mechanistic models, uh, the, there was a question about um, more of the precipitation falling as rain, and both of those mechanistic models include a weather generator that would account for that. So if the increase in temperatures is uh, making it so that more of the precipitation in winter is likely to fall as rain, then that will be picked up by those two models. We, we also played, we, we did some sensitivity analyses where we held temperature constant and we increased precipitation a little bit or a lot. And I think that we didn't see very many general patterns as to how that was affecting model predictions. Is that right, Katie? Yeah, and we increased precipitation sort of far above what is expected based on the GCMs and still didn't see as big of a response from the models as we did to that increase in temperature. So, so one lesson from this research, I know that because sagebrush grows in a water-limited area, you know, arid and semi-arid ecosystems, we're always thinking primarily about the importance of water. but. One, I think, important result from our research is that sagebrush also responds, should respond directly to temperature alone, even without these changes in precipitation. Um, and that it, and if we're looking, if we're thinking about climate change, there's going to be, the changes in temperature are likely to be bigger than the changes in precipitation, and that may be the primary driver of change. Great. Thank you. Um, just so you guys know, we have quite a few questions that came in. I think more than we are going to have a chance to answer 
during today's session. So in just a moment, I'm going to put up a slide with some contact information if anybody wants to follow up offline with some of those. And I will also make sure all questions we receive today get passed on to our speakers as well so they can follow up with those. Um, but here's one more question that I will pass on to you as I um, get ready to put that information up, and that is, what do you see as some potential applications of your findings to range-wide sagebrush conservation? Well, so last month we had a meeting with those folks that I, I showed on, on the first slide, and we talked quite a bit about where in the operations of these agencies or conservation groups, where is information like this applicable? And, and I think we mostly agreed that, that this kind of information can guide planning at broad scales and long time horizons. You know, somebody who's trying to decide where to site a particular, um, I don't know, a re restoration project, a particular habitat improvement project at, at, say, the district scale right now, it's not clear how helpful this will be. But if there's somebody in a state office who's trying to prioritize, try and make these decisions, thinking about a 20-year time horizon and thinking about the whole state, then perhaps this is where um, our information can be useful. And, and as I tried to emphasize on, click through, oh, I think that Liz is showing her screen now. Um, in the implication slides, I tried to emphasize that if, if you're in these, these cooler areas where we show our blue points, managers should probably not think too much about climate change. It should be focusing more on existing threats. In those, those red areas, those hotter areas that seem more vulnerable to climate change, I'd be um, wary of, of spending lots of money on sagebrush conservation and restoration, especially where the resistance and, fr and resilience framework is also raising red flags. So the fact that we're seeing some signs of correlation between climate change vulnerability and resistance and resilience I think that that can help help people think about these results. You know, we're we're trying to relate our results to a framework that that people are already using. Do you want to add anything, Katie? No, that sounds good. Great, thank you both. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Rick Carney to say a few kind of final closing words. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, uh, Peter, and, and thank you very much, everyone who's on the, the phone right now, uh, for attending today's webinar. A recording of this presentation will be available on our website later this week. If you have any questions about the LCC or this research, please feel free to contact Peter or myself. Our contact information is displayed on the screen. Please make sure to join us on Monday, December 5th at 1 p.m. Pacific for the last webinar in our 2016 webinar series on functional continuity of habitat for the pygmy rabbit. Last but not least, we really want to know what you thought of today's webinar. Please take two minutes to complete our short survey that will appear on your screen as you log off. Your feedback is very valuable and helps us to plan and improve future webinars. So on behalf of the Great Basin Landscape Conservation Cooperative, and folks at Utah State University, we very much appreciate your participation today and wish for you a good rest of the day. Goodbye.